Hello and welcome to the Magical Midlife Podcast, where you get a refreshing, uplifting and optimistic perspective on life in your 40s and 50s. I'm your host, Lindsay DeSwart, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here today. So let's jump right in. Good morning. Welcome to the Magical Midlife. It's fabulous to have you back here today. I'm so delighted that you're listening in and you're tuning in. So today's guest is Kira Roddenbush, and Kira has a podcast called What's Up With Your Stuff, and she today is talking all about how all of our need for stuff and being surrounded by stuff and buying new stuff is actually related also to the tension we hold in our bodies. So it sounds like an unusual combination, but when you listen in, you're going to understand how it's all connected, and it's pretty fascinating, and I think it might be the most important decluttering um, conversation that you've listened to so far this year and possibly ever. Okay, enjoy the show. Hey, Kira, how are you doing? Hello, Lindsay. I'm wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. How are you doing? Yo, just lovely. We're sitting in freezing cold temperatures. And so (laughs) I am so delighted to be in front of my computer talking to a beautiful person in a warmer place. (laughs) Yes, definitely. I don't know. We're uh, we're just a little bit warmer here in Portland, but it, we always have the rain at this time um, of year. But yes, l- keeps us inside you. as well. Yes, yes, indeed. right. Okay, so we are here today. Obviously, we want to find out more about you, but also I am really excited to tune into your wisdom about a topic that is so current and so hot it seems at the moment. And I actually posted about it uh, just yesterday in the Facebook group, in the Magical Midlife Facebook group, because it keeps coming up. And it's also a reminder, because I heard a webinar about this topic years and years and years ago, and I have never forgotten it. So when I met you, I went, oh my goodness, she knows about this. I'm going to have to pick her brains. So Please. today is the day I get to ask the question. Let's do it. Let's can. do it. Ask, what, ask away. Ask away. Excellent. So I'd love for you to tell us all a little bit about you and, and then that will set the stage for where we're going today. Perfect. I've always uh, nutshelled myself as a California born New Yorker from Texas. Uh, I spent most of my formative years in Texas, in suburban Texas, and then went to university in Austin. And I had a very typical Texas suburban upbringing. Um, No, nothing really. We did have a, actually, let me punctuate that. We, I, growing up, experienced two catastrophic floods that washed our home and our neighborhood away. Like I just glossed right over that. Like it's nothing, but actually that definitely was one of the germination points for my relationship to stuff and my awareness that easy come easy go. Uh, there is an image of my mother standing waist high in in flood water, grasping at the pages of our family tree the genealogy just floating away with this just like and and one of her friends being like let it go let it go let it go like we and so in her mind at that moment that that was our family tree that was our heritage it was just washing away down the river and the truth is you know if you fast forward 40 plus years all of that information is immediately available for us at our Mm -hmm. fingertips in a way that we never would imagine possible back then. So for so, so grew up in small town Texas, uh, suburban Texas and then when uh, some friends returned from New York City and they said, "You know what? Texas isn't big enough for you. You need to go to Manhattan." Uh, <laughs> and I made the move there in my early 20s and I was a bit of a club kid and really just sort of looking for I always used to joke that I moved to New York City so that I because I wanted to be a character on Sex and the City. And then I left New York City because I was turning into a character on Sex and the City. <laughs> so it's like, I really did sort of enjoy the last bit of my 20s and very first part of my 30s in that city. And it 
taught me a lot about what would become my skill set. I learned to live in a really small space and Mm -hmm. in the process began doing this work of organizing for other people. And this was before organizing, which my, my job that I do now is licensed massage therapist and organizing consultant. So when I first started with the organizing bit, um, it was a job that other people recommended me for. This girl knows what she's doing. She can come in and transform your space. It didn't have a name. It wasn't a profession. Uh, it was just something that I did. I didn't even know how to, to bill for my time, but I would just show up and, and work with a, and it's a wide range of clients. And this all happened through word of mouth, through a variety of environments. So I worked with families. I worked with individuals. I worked with full-blown hoarding disorders. And I worked with super posh penthouse folks. So I would go from one environment to another. And it was really so much fun for me to just sort of get into people's stuff. So yeah. after I became started to become a, a character on. on, oh yeah. I yeah. have got a question. Yes. Because so far, it sounds totally logical, except for the fact that you also said you're the massage therapist. So Yes, that how, didn't come for a while. Yeah, so how do, how do you combine the massage therapy and the organizing of people's spaces? Right. How did that all come about? Because that's not like the most easily linked connection. I'd have thought. No, basically. no. But I said, th- okay, so what happened was that life in New York City for a club kid can be, surprise, surprise, a little toxic. And <laughs> I always had enough of a, my, I kept my platforms firmly on the ground. If I wasn't dancing on a speaker, I still had, you know, my, my feet firmly planted on the ground enough to say like, all right, I probably want to start taking better care of myself and start, started to really put a lot of focus into wellness and being in a city where you're just surrounded by it it can be an incredibly toxic environment just the overwhelm the environmental overwhelm it really led me into a space where I started to seek out alternative therapies for things Mm -hmm. and um, I got really interested in Ayurveda and uh, that was probably about 1996 so it hadn't really taken over the American mainstream yet or Mm -hmm. the North American mainstream it was still pretty uh under the radar and I so I decided to as I was getting let's just say a a broken heart factors into it and I had taken a couple of trips out to Portland Oregon meanwhile I had had friends from Austin go and Uh, relocate to Portland and establish a little bit of a community. So there was a space out there for me. I was looking at the natural college of natural of the national college of natural medicine Mm -hmm. and uh, looking at becoming a naturopath um, just as a result of all of the, the, the self-help journey that I began in New Mm -hmm. York city as a result of trying to deal with a toxic environment just naturally led me to this place where I wanted to be doing this for other people. I also had uh, thought that the best way for me to jumpstart my fitness routine was to sign up for the New York marathon and just start running, even though I had never run before in my life. So I really went for it. This was in 1998. And uh, this was in before I had even considered massage I had had a fall, not as a result of running, that really put my body into such a, a, I was in so much pain for such a consistent amount of time. I didn't know what I was going to be able to do. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that made it, the pain go away was running. And so I just kept running until it didn't hurt anymore. So I was just doing more and more damage to myself, obviously, and had no idea because I was just young and heartbroken and pushing myself into wellness, optimal wellness. Optimal so wellness. once my, right, totally. So once my body started to reject what I was doing to it, um, I found a brilliant chiropractor who had a deep tissue massage therapist and 
that I started to receive regular treatments Mm -hmm. to deal with a herniated disc so that I would not have to uh, undergo surgery. I was like, if we can deal with this without, I was enough on my wellness journey that I knew I did not want anybody cutting into me if they did Yeah, not nobody wants spinal surgery if there's <laughs> any other way around. No. no. Right. So watching what, and then I started working with a personal trainer and I mm-hmm. decided I was going to build my body back up from the inside out and get really wise about it this time and not go for a fad result. So mm. that did really you do set the New York me. Marathon, by the way? No, I oh. ran a 30 K in August of that year. And I hobbled through that thing to the finish line. <laughs> my dialogue said, my mantra was, if you don't finish this, there's no way you're running the marathon. If you can't finish this, you can't run a marathon. Mm. So I, as I hobbled over the finish line, I told myself, you know what? I don't need those other six miles that bad. <laughs> like no, I, I've done seriously. enough, that's enough running. So I, I found that the distance that I felt the most comfortable with was like a, a half marathon yes. or like they're a 10 K you can still really challenge yourself and not have, I didn't have anything to prove yeah. through that, but that was a real, I had to really come to terms with that in and of itself. I feel like the, that the first quarter of my life was dealing with those sort of even the body image issues that said, you're, you're, you'll never be an athlete. There's no way wow. that you can ever do all of this stuff. So in my Saturn return, boy, I was going to prove everybody wrong. And I just totally went for it, blew myself out, started building it back up. And um, through massage was able to get to a point where I was pain-free. And it was such cool. a, it was a gradual journey But it was a day that I woke up and got through my morning before before realizing that I wasn't in excruciating pain. And and, uh, it just really woke me up to the body's innate wisdom and its desire to be in a healing space. And it just really, that definitely was a a linchpin. So then I wanted to become a naturopath. I wanted to do the whole, because again, it's not... I've got to run the marathon. I can't I was gonna just say like, just, how you right? do anything is how you do everything. Totally. So, but the, so I go for it. And then as I'm finding myself in a statistics class back, getting ready to like in a community college, getting prerequisites for a pre-med pre-certification, I was like, I don't want to do this. And <laughs> I just thought like, I got, um, this is not this isn't what I want to do. What I want to do is, is help people. Mm. And I want to get my hands on people. And, uh, so I went into massage and when I completed my massage training, um, part of our final project was like sort of envisioning the sort of practice that you wanted for yourself. And I envisioned this place that was like sleep away camp for grownups where you could just like go do like yoga and you know, meditation retreats and have all these like wonderful organic vegetarian meals. And it would be near rushing water and all of the things. And it turned out there was a place that was exactly like that two hours away from where I was going to school. So I got my first real massage job out at a place called Brighton Bush Hot Springs, which is an intentional community up in the Cascade mountains in Oregon. So I had left New York, came to Oregon, went to massage school, went up to the mountains. And uh, the the very first summer that I was there, I met a couple who was visiting from New York City. And the whole time I had been living in Portland and in massage school, I still would go back and forth to New York because I had organizing clients that would fly me out there seasonally to switch out their linens or flip over the closets or take care Mm -hmm. of whatever. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was, uh, you know, but it's, I would take advantage and, and extend the trip and see all my clients and then mm. just kind of like would make that part of the package. Like I can come back seasonally and help you out. So it, it was, uh, definitely part of my professional trajectory. I wasn't going to let go of that. There's a yeah. piece that I get when I'm helping people in their spaces that, I didn't want to let go of. And it's also a part of my personality that no matter where I am, even if I'm on a massage job, people would tell me like, I know when you've worked because all of the sheets and towels have been refolded and they're all (laughs) perfect. Cause like, if there is any downtime, I, I can't help myself. It's just, it's like, uh, 
it's meditative for me to, right. to get things nice and tidy. Yeah. And, um, and I also want to say, that's not to say that I can't let them get out of control and messy because the truth mm-hmm. is you don't get to get them tidy if you don't get them messy. Yeah, so like, that's true. I love, I love a messy environment. Like that means like that's full of potential for me. Yeah. So so I would do this everywhere. And I, so I met this couple my very first summer out at the commune and they were visiting from New York city and they, uh, presented me with a, we had a conversation. The husband was a client. He was, was on my table and we got into a little bit of conversation. And when he found out where I was from and that I was considering going back in the mm-hmm. fall, he said, Oh my God, we need to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Now this piece of it was crucial because when I went back to New York that time, it was the first time I had gone back to organizing full time after having become a massage therapist. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that my internal dialogue, whether I'm dealing with a bunch of tangled cords in a drawer or a bunch of tangled cords of musculature, my internal dialogue is very similar. And so I just would find myself sort of tapping into the same headspace of just like massaging environments as I would be massaging people. And then to take it a step further, I began to notice from this client specifically that I'm talking about, when I started my journey with him, he was beyond my help. I'll just say it like that. It was a, it, it was a situation that was definitely as extreme as anything I've ever seen on any television show anywhere. Wow. Okay. But the, but there was a, a hope from his now ex-wife that Mm. maybe something could be done. Okay. This again, even though organizing wasn't a thing, uh, hoarding disorders were not a thing. Even though I had worked with folks Mm. who had unhealthy attachments to their belongings, it still wasn't a diagnosable illness. It wasn't, it wasn't, there were not television shows about it. Right. It was just something like eccentric folks might have this disorder. Yeah. You didn't hear about it consistently. It wasn't, they, we hadn't pulled the curtain back yet on mm. the, the tragedy of convenience and what it's done to our environment. Mm, that's so true. We'll have to come back to that because it's yeah. so true. It's really what it is ultimately. So, and, and but that's, it's uh, it's able to create um, a, a disorder. And mm-hmm. it's, it's able to, yes, we'll come back to that. So as I was working in this gentleman's bathroom, I noticed that everything, cause that's the room where I started because quite literally uh, in New York city, I mean, it's the size of this bed that I'm sitting on right mm-hmm. now. It's like, yeah, fair it's enough. A, and it's a, uh, usually not a very emotional space. The needs, the the things are their expiration dates are pretty clearly marked. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, it's pretty easy to to take care of a bathroom in a, in a quick period of time. Yeah. So I noticed that on this gentleman's shelves, everything that he had, they were all treating either digestive and elimination disorders mm-hmm. or skin disorders. Mm-hmm. So this, after having had the knowledge of the of anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and all of the, the pathologies and all of the things you have to study for massage, mm-hmm. I just like immediately was like, he's not eliminating anything. And like whatever he's Mm -hmm. attempting to eliminate is so toxic that he's like suppressing it. He's like the entire cycle of elimination has been interrupted. And so I just thought, "Hmm, what is, what's going on here with this individual? It was an extreme, extreme case. And it's, it's something that almost anyone with uh, an excess of stuff you'll yeah. find that there's a blockage somewhere that they're not releasing things the way they need to yeah. either on an energetic or an emotional level or a physical level. It's, it's not about the stuff. There's something going on and the stuff ends up being either uh, a protective barrier um, mm-hmm. between the individual and their trauma. It's like a protective blanket. Yeah, It's a wall to keep people at bay. This isn't an extreme case, but it, it shows up in, in varying degrees for all of us. Wow. Like get into that in a minute. But Or it's a, a tendency towards perfectionism, which says, I haven't mastered this yet, mm-hmm. so I can't release it unless I've mastered it or else I'm a failure. But what that ends up doing 
those of us who don't suffer from extreme overconsumption or hoarding disorders, just for those of us who like are like walking past the same pile of whatever on our desk that triggers the brain to say, I, I'm not an, I'm not enough. I haven't mm-hmm. done enough. I'm, I haven't completed yesterday yet. I mm-hmm. haven't. So it, it triggers this negative thought process that will then eventually begin to show up in the mind and in the body. Mm-hmm. So I began to really pay attention to this with my clients. And because I do a lot of out call massage, I would also notice it when I would bring my table into people's environments, I could sort of like holographically work with them. Like just sort of feel this, like how is their environment showing up in their body? You could just see what's, what are they hanging on to that is clouding the vibration? And it's not that it's mine to ever diagnose. It's mine to Mm. reflect. Mm. This is what I'm seeing, but I'm just like spelunking. Wow. Just, you know, diving for the information and I can see the other thing I think is fascinating is that people can come off as being completely together. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I just need deep pressure. I just need you to like, I, yeah, I run 50 K's and I I'm doing great. And so just get, get in there and tear me apart. But if you just barely touch them, they'll (laughs) flip out the whole thing falls apart yeah and that and so I will see that in people who are like you walk in and their spaces seem absolutely divine but god forbid you try to open a closet or open a drawer it's like it's all been stuffed away we're not doing that like we're only on the surface so I really feel like for the practice that I do and for the way I like to show up for people, there's an active intention of taking a consistent inventory of your space, your belongings, how you feel in that space Mm -hmm. and what thoughts are triggered for you in the space and by your items. And then how do those sort of like create that cascading domino effect of thoughts that will either open us up to our potential or make us feel limited in our story. Yeah. And what can we release so that we can create greater range of motion inside of that container and we can actually tell the story that you really want to tell in your body and in your oh my that is so profound. Because it is, such, I love it. It's such a giveaway. Yeah. And for somebody who works with people, I know exactly what you mean. That it's almost like the cleaner and shinier everything is, you've just got to dig a little bit deeper. But it's not hard to find. Right. That nobody is all together. Nobody has got everything sorted out. Because right. that's just not who we are as human beings. No, it's but not the you, point of this experience. No, but for you to make that connection of what's going on in the body versus what's going on in the environment, it's it's like you've got the key and it's unlocked this whole bigger picture. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I it's love it. Fascinating. You see people, you see folks talking about all of these indiv- it's like it's a braid to me. Like I see people talking about the link between trauma and clutter or between trauma and the body, each one of them can pair up, but it's Mm. like, you realize this is all the, it's all the same thing. Mm. It's like, what level is it showing up on? And Mm. it's only, if somebody's on my table and they're like, it's, it's made its way into the corporeal experience, whatever the thing is, whatever the message is that needs to be addressed. And the clutter is an indicator that we're just not going to listen to that right now. We're just going to keep on working on, Mm -hmm. keep on distracting ourselves with this and this and this and this. Because what I find for myself, Lindsay, is that, and I also feel like I have to say this disclaimer, I am a mother of three, ranging in age from five to 14, Mm -hmm. with a husband who, bless his heart, he does help out. He does help out. And unless you have an individual who's, sole job it is to follow every single person around in their orbit and keep it all in place. I don't care how tidy you are. 
it's going to, the wheels are going to come off at some point because yeah. people are living in a space. Yeah. So the goal is to get the space and the body in a place where when the wheels start to come off, you know, where are the tools to put the wheels back on? It's not like the wheels aren't ever going to come off. Mm. They're always going to come off. That's mm. part of the process. Mm. And you don't necessarily like the, it makes the ride a little more interesting. Like, yeah. you know, there's, you need to have some bumps in the road, but it's just like, how do we keep it together so that we're not like just strapping it to the top of the jalopy and it's all falling off as we're hitting those bumps, you know, like metaphorically, we got to like create the flow. And a lot of that has to do with getting really clear on what, what unmade decisions are lingering Mm. that we're not addressing. And how do we uh, just tie up those loose ends. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean, I think that one of the biggest lessons for me with decluttering is honestly, let it go. Let yeah. it go. Like, what do you, and, and people get so attached. I mean, I told you the story of the, the painting behind me and yeah. how precious, how many generations that goes through. But the truth is having seen my childhood float away twice, That's- whatever. Yeah, that's going to make you want to hang on to something. <laughs> yes, and it, life goes on even yeah. when you don't have that. It's not about the stuff; it's about the connections and mm-hmm. how equipped are we to weather the storm in our little vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> so, tell me some of the telltale signs because I know we've had conversations in the past, and I and also I've listened to your podcast, which we'll talk about later. But there are some telltale signs. So things like you know, you can identify the date of the trauma. Oh my word. That is always fascinating to me. Okay. Yeah. There are a couple of those or just the sources of the trauma. Well, here's one that's been coming up for me recently. I found, I, this is years ago. I was working with a client who had been in a situation that was like a a bit of a, a hoarding situation. And I was able to really over many years create a lot of space for her. But the first part of it had to do with removing animal waste from her home. And this was in a teeny tiny little New York city space. And she was really sort of, she was pretty despondent through most of the experience. Mm -hmm. It took a while for me to get to the layer that really triggered the most reaction from her, she would just sort of like lay on her couch and, and tell me what to do. And I was doing as much as I could to try to create space for her. Eventually Mm -hmm. I got to a tiny little box that was in another tiny little box. I picked it up off the shelf. It's covered in dust. And she just starts sobbing. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. And I, so what is it? And it was, one of her dog's ashes, the, the, her companion, her precious companion Mm -hmm. that had passed. I was like, okay, so let's talk about this. When did this dog die? And like, so then we started to go back through what, and, and peeling back the layers of her trauma, it was pretty evident that that's when things really hit the skids for her. Like that's where it all had started. Mm. So we cleared space. Mm -hmm cleared off the box, like created a sweet little altar for it. And I was just like, listen, you know, we got to, we're going to remove the animal waste and we're going to honor your pup, you know, Mm -hmm. and like create the space and just watching how she was able then to start to release the rest of it. But it was like people become arrested at the point where the the damage happens Mm -hmm. and they just start to retreat and, and, create layers and layers of stuff. Another story that I found really like, this was one of those things that kind of put it together. And this is more of like the trauma and the stuff and not so much in the body itself, but it, I worked with an event coordinator ongoing for several years Mm -hmm. and I watched her play. I had to convince her that what she needed was an organizer. She thought she needed an office manager and she was working out of her home. And I, when I came to interview, I was like looking around, I was like, I can't, if you want me to manage your office, Mm -hmm. I have to 
manage all this first. Because I was going to say, you've got to find getting, the office. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And it was all, everything was hidden behind screens and she was extremely polished and put together on the exterior. Wow. And she had a long-term boyfriend that she had been with for six years and they had been engaged and were supposed to have married years before, but she had called off the wedding. Mm -hmm. Now, and then they were just sort of at this like comfortable standstill with their, uh, with their relationship. And it wasn't really moving in any sort of a direction, but they were still going to get married one day. So, and this is somebody who plans weddings as a job. So she had literally files and files. This is pre pre internet, even yeah. just stuff everywhere. Um, how to plan the perfect wedding. But then she has this other separate box in her closet with a bunch of clothes that don't fit, that aren't serving her, that are, and, and I said, what is all of this stuff? She said, oh, well, this is from, for my wedding. And I was like, what, the, the wedding that you're planning? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, this is from when I was going to get married, that when we were going to get married the first time. And I was like, you realize that you won't get married the second time until you get rid of this basket of stuff. Like you need to get mm. rid of this because your whatever marriage you're stepping into is not the marriage that you were planning that you yeah. walked away from. It's a completely separate. And she's like, but there are things in here. I'm like, right, but it's your job to have access to all the information. It's mm -hmm. not like this is, this is a security blanket that is smothering you. Like you need to yeah. let go of it to create more space for the future of your relationship. And we have to release all of the clothes mm -hmm. like that don't fit you anymore. Everything. It just has to be you today now. And it's amazing to see how those commitments to who am I today and how do I want to show up in the world without the attachment to all this stuff of a personal history mm -hmm. creates the space to move forward into the narrative that you're actually trying to create for yourself. But the identity clutter will quite literally keep you physically trapped in oh your my story goodness. if you don't release it. Right. It's, it's, and it's getting people to understand that. And when you see the light go off and then it's just, and even the awareness that it's, if it's information, it's out there. Mm -hmm. You can acquire it again. Mm -hmm. It's if it's a, a tangible physical item, like what more do you need? Yeah. This is a story that I keep telling over and over again, but it happened on my way from Texas to New York City. Mm -hmm. My sister and I stopped at the Smithsonian Museum. She and I were driving from Texas to New York where I gave her my car and told her, Sayonara, take it. Like dump me off with my stuff and you can have my car. Wow. So we stopped on the way at the Smithsonian so I could find the Ruby slippers because they had just acquired them. And it was a big touchstone for me. Yeah. And I did find them, but the thing that actually captured my attention for the longest period of time was this little, like, uh, the windows that they do at like a diorama of an experience. And it right. was a window into a Buddhist monk's cell and it had a bedroll and a cushion and a low table and a candle and a quill and a scroll. And that was it. That was it. I sat there like literally just like stunned for like 45 minutes, just trying to think about what would I need if I were in there? Well, if your meals are out here, yeah. If your meditations are here and here, like what else do you need? Yeah. In the space that you're in besides what you need. And so yeah. I took that message with me to New York where I was literally starting over with a lot of nothing mm -hmm. and then took that same messaging with me to Portland, Oregon, where I lived with a friend in a bedroom at her home while she raised her kids. And then to a tent in the middle of the woods where I just like, it, it helped me to not accumulate stuff, but I, I still have these little, the, the box of mementos will mm -hmm. follow me around, mm -hmm. but it's a box. It's yeah. A it's, box. It's, it's not like, a whole I don't need, no, mm. no. And so my kids, I've always tried to, 
I mean, it may be a little rough, but as soon as they even began to cultivate an attachment to like a, a stuffy or a wooly or anything, I, it would just disappear for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't throw it away, but like, mm-hmm. I just tuck it away and let them, you know, like, let's find it. Like, how else can we self-soothe without putting this reliance on this particular object? Because mm. it's so transitory. Our things mm. are not there. It's, it's, they're distractions from yeah, doing the real work. So let's go back to something that you talked about earlier and just saying about that we're in such a culture of overconsumption. I can't remember the exact words that you used, but we just take in so much Convenient. stuff. Convenience. Okay, you. so yeah, and Lindsay, what about, I mean, this, okay, so the, I came into all of this work pre-pandemic. Yeah. But I feel like the the calling has, once we collectively, globally, this, I, I keep thinking, you know, we had this great pause mm. and and what did we learn? everything's different and nothing has changed yes fair enough (laughs) it's so so but that isn't that the history of humanity but I think that when we collectively have to experience this and depending on our level of access and and privilege there was uh, I know for myself any uh, I did everything I could to uh create a surplus for my family Mm -hmm. while we were locked down and that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say I was taking too much toilet paper, but I did take advantage of the opportunity to make sure that, you know, every time I would consider like, oh, I don't need to be that prepared. You know, I stop behind a a bus that's like earthquake preparedness. Do you have your, however many gallons per person in Mm -hmm. the household? Like, you know, Portland has a, a, a real, we sort of operate with this low grade not just pandemic, but this, oh my gosh, the the next big one means we're all going to just, everybody west of the river is going to slide off into the ocean. So there's this like doomsday undercurrent that happens, which gets people, I mean, you couple that with like cultural unrest and a global pandemic. And it's, uh, there's a, a, people have sort of, I think, around the world, those that have been able to have sort of absorbed a little more maybe mm-hmm. than they needed to. Yeah. And then it hits this apex where we realize, oh, this is just what we do now. We're going to have to evolve with right. this reality. So how much of this stuff do we really need? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's like, I've seen for myself and my own family, this influx of resources where mm-hmm. we just made sure that the deep freeze was full and that the the larder was set and that we all, you know, everything was taken care of as we could. And then you yeah. start to circle back around and you realize like, oh, this stuff is going to expire if I don't use it. <laughs> and then what's it worth? Yeah. Right. So why do, what kind of a buffer does a family of five actually need? And how much of this is mental clutter of a doomsday scenario that may or may not actually happen? And uh, spoiler alert, if it does really happen, you're good luck. That, I was that, say. What's that stash really going to do for you? Like, yeah. it's like, it's, a, no, I mean, I had to go through this with a client not too long ago who was, had her bin of pandemic or um, of, of emergency stock that was mm-hmm. non-perishable food items that were expired. And I said, okay, so why do we have these? And she's like, well, that's in case. And I'm like, in case what you have the same food items that aren't expired right here on your shelf. So if you really, really need to have your (laughs) bug out kit, can we rotate this stock out with this new stock that won't expire for another Mm. three years? And then you can just replenish. (laughs) And she was like, no, but this, it won't ever go bad. And I was like, right. But what reality are you going to, I'm like, so we're going to be sitting here in the big one, the, the stinky candles that you can't throw away because they were a gift, but they give you migraines. So we're going to keep them up in this <laughs> cabinet just in case. I'm like, like, you know, licking your finger and getting that dehydrated pea soup out of the foil envelope while you're, you know, warming yourself over the stinky candle that gives you <laughs> migraines. While the rest of the world is on fire, like, no, honey, that's not going to happen. That's not how we're going to play this out, right? So so like what, when we, uh, I think that culturally, 
we've become slaves to convenience. We have become enslaved to convenience. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether whether or not we want to admit it, unless you are actively stepping out of that little rat race and living completely off the grid and never ordering from Amazon and never mm-hmm. doing any of the things that the rest of mass culture has managed to get kind of sucked into. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to... I think that individually, we definitely have the responsibility to to mitigate and minimize our consumption and our clutter, but we also have to collectively demand more of the structures that are continuing to create this, make money off of the depletion of all of our resources. Mm. That's what it really ends up coming down to is that like all of this stuff is what's catapulting us to yeah. uh, uh, unsustainability yeah there is one store actually that's in canada at the moment and their current marketing campaign is buy better buy less yeah which is funny for a retail store to have buy better buy less and you can look at it from whichever perspective you want are they asking you to spend more on right. a higher quality item or are they asking uh, you to actually buy less whatever it is clever. Yeah, whichever way they're doing it, whichever perception you want to come at it from, if it makes you question what you're buying, then I'm choosing to like their slogan. Because it's too easy to say, I haven't got, you know, the exact perfect solution for this scenario. Therefore, I will go out and buy what I think the exact perfect solution is, even if the chances of that scenario ever happening again are minimal. But still, it's too easy to go out and say, yeah, I've got to have that particular thing. Yes. It's not, there's never a a make do enough kind of filter. Yes. There was, is it, uh, I was just listening to some story about writers and I can't remember which three it was, but there were these three writers and one was bragging to the other two about his latest book deal or whatever and as he walked away one said to the other you could be doing the same and he's Mm -hmm. like yeah but I have something he'll never have which is enough (laughs) and I just that is like one of those things where I I know we all have to establish that for ourselves where are those limits um I'm all for having a cozy warm nurturing environment I Mm -hmm don't think that it that I don't think that those things that that clutter has to be unmanageable I'm just much more of like a a inventory it because if you don't know that you have it or if you have it but you can't find it when you need it what use is it so if you can if folks can manage their inventory awesome whatever that is, they get Mm. to write their own story with their inventory. But I just think that most of us have a tendency, even with the best of intentions to bring in more than we're releasing Mm. because our culture is set up to, to, to create that flow. Like we're supposed, like the, the machine works when we get fatter and sicker Mm. and thicker and take on more that's so it's up to us to sort of counter that and and actively issue that that expectation and realize like that we have to do that uh, individually and um it's and I do think that the machine may it has the capacity to understand that that healthy people can make just as much money for it as, as sick people. Mm -hmm. But part of what I find is that if you can take a consistent inventory of your belongings and you're aware of what you're taking on and you're being consistent in your inventory of your habits, it's just a lot easier to weather the, the bumps in the road. Essentially Mm -hmm. it's easier to find your baseline if you're not taking in more than you're releasing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, yeah. the, the home knows the home knows like it's like and it, it's like the body knows like it's like if you are decluttering your space and it starts to feel gaunt or like there's nothing to hang on to. It's like bring bring another throw pillow back in, you know, mm. toss a rug down like it doesn't have to be 
like completely barren or void of charm. It just means, does it have a story? Is it serving you? Is it reflecting the, the, the you that you want to present to the world and the you that you want to invite people into? Yeah. And, and it's just such an amazing mirror of the body as well. Completely. I think that's what's Completely. so fascinating. So do you see any trends where people are holding their stuff in their body and where the blockages are happening in the house? I think that honestly, for so many people, the truth is our guts, our abdomens, because mm. even in massage, it's an area where people don't, they usually don't request abdominal massage. Mm. It's usually something that people will go in for specifically. It's a very sensitive, tender area. It's where there's like a such vulnerable ability there but it's also when I think about I mean it's so many vital organs there and I think that it can really like it's another area that it's part of why I start with the bathroom and the kitchen is to try <laughs> to like clear the space for it to move out of the body mm -hmm. physically and then when I'm organizing and then clearing out the kitchen I would say that I find that more that people have a tendency to ignore what's happening in their gut and in their abdomen, probably more than anywhere else. I also see it a lot when folks are super in their head and it's all happening up here. There's like a, it's, it's evident that there's something that is being avoided. If there's not a release of the, the cranium, that there's like a, a thought process that is, that is cluttered, that there's like a, no, I got to hang on to this. I got to hang on to it. And so it's, always seeing where people are holding. Like mm -hmm. I see mo mothers, new moms, especially like getting them to just open their hands and let go. They'll just be laying <laughs> down like this. And it's just, or like, the, it's like trying to get them to completely open up. So I think that it's, it's in those sorts of patterns as well. In these mm -hmm. times when folks are in very receptive, to, like when people are, inviting in a new member of the family. And that comes with lots of clutter mm -hmm. and it comes with lots of like, I just have to hang on to everything right now. It's like trying to show them what things that are actually really not necessary. And, and that I find that the more frequently folks are willing to, and it doesn't have to be massage, but tap into that level of self-care, the easier it is for them to release it from their environment. Mm, love that. Fantastic. Yeah. So that is such a great kind of, you know, wrap up and also advice actually for people listening. Yes. Um, if people like what they've heard today, how can they find you and also tell us about your podcast? Thank you so much. I have a podcast called What's Up With Your Stuff. It's available on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. And it's conversations on the consequences of clutter, where I speak with current and former clients and fellow body workers and organizers and writers and regular folks. And just, I like to ask people, what's up with your stuff? And it's just sort of a, it gives folks a chance to really plumb the depth of their particular passions and, and the stuff that's specific to the jobs that they do, because everybody's world requires a different level of attachment to its things. And so mm -hmm. as a professional organizer and as a body worker, it's never my place to come in and tell people, let go of it. This is what's got to go. I just like to hear people share what is serving them. So that's what we talk about on my podcast. And then if that's interesting to you, you can find... I have an open Facebook group that is the same name. What's up with your stuff podcast and people. I'd love to see folks join us there. And we talk about all kinds of organizing tips and tricks and techniques. And it's a forum that I'm just totally open to all types of conversation from anyone. And you can find me on Instagram at Kira Rodenbush. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay. So that's where people can find you. I think. More than anything, I just want to thank you so very much. That's 
it's such a revealing connection. And I love the fact that it came up so very early on. And I went, hold on a minute. And yet you're so how, very, very welcome. Well, it's it's how it's all knitted together through your journey and how the relationship between stuff being held within and without it's yeah it's fantastic and it's so eye-opening because people would never make that connection well thank you it's a fantastic fascinating conversation that is really infinite because you know we all have bodies and we all have stuff and we all have our own relationships with them but that's what I find so engaging is that everybody's got their own answer to that question and uh you know, what's up with your stuff. And it's, it's, it's embedded. So let's peel back the layers. Super, super cool. What did you think of the show today? If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform that you're listening on. Also, you can come and join us at the Facebook group for the Magical Midlife. And on Instagram, if you're on Instagram, I'm under Lindsay DeSwart, where you will find the podcast being released there every Wednesday. I really look forward to seeing you there and hearing your comments and any questions. And please come over to the Instagram account or to the Facebook group where you will find downloads and free gifts to help you lead your most magical midlife. See you there.